Tonight on Nation to Nation, the federal election is just four days away. Should Justin Trudeau be kicked out of office? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. Uh, I think that the momentum he's, uh, he's built over the last four years has been very progressive for Indigenous people in particular in this country. A new Chalant political scientist grades the Trudeau government's environmental record. I, I would give them a B uh, because there's been a lot of progress made. Um, they've put their their money where their mouth is, so to speak. And this Navajo man is running to be President of the United States. He says the word reconciliation should never be used. And even the term reconciliation is problematic. Reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. Hello, I'm Todd Lameron and welcome to Nation to Nation. The election is only days away and if recent polling is accurate, a Liberal or Conservative minority government is a distinct possibility. As we reported in the past here at APTN, Indigenous support for Justin Trudeau and the Liberals has collapsed. But is his record that bad that he deserves to be replaced after just four years? To discuss that, I'm joined by a panel of political junkies. I hope I can call you guys that. Uh, to my, my immediate right is Pitsy Olak Pfeiffer, an Indigenous policy consultant and owner of Inuit Solutions. In the middle is Carolyn O'Neill, morning journalist at Ottawa's Indigenous radio station Element FM. And at the end is Alden Cor Coburn. He's Algonquin and an assistant professor of Indigenous Studies at the University of Ottawa. Welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, I'm going to start with you. Does Trudeau deserve to be kicked out of office? <laughs> well, the short answer is no. Uh, I think that the momentum he's, uh, he's built over the last four years has been very progressive for Indigenous people in particular in this country. Four-year mandates, as we know, are, are too short to be able to demonstrate a, a track record of, of, of commitment. But what we've seen in, the, in this first four years of, of his reign, we've seen some great investments. And uh, although the rhetoric is often a little too much, the results have uh, shown that uh, he's been very committed to Indigenous people, especially Inuit in the Arctic. Is there a bit of a disconnect then? Because a lot of grassroots people uh, don't like him, don't want him to get reelected. But the leaders, of course, uh, do praise him. And rightfully, they should be praising him. Uh, again, uh, if we look at the very beginning of his, of his uh, tenure, uh, his mandate letters to his ministers, his, his, a very important element of those mandate letters was f for the relationship with Indigenous peoples. We've never seen that before, and uh, it's changing the political culture of this country, and, and I think it needs to continue. Ms. O'Neill, uh, what you've just heard, would you agree with that assessment, or do you have a different opinion? I agree that the mandate should continue, but I also do think there are some very valid questions about how the Trudeau government has approached Indigenous issues and worked with Indigenous peoples. I think that there are some questions about some of the bills that stalled in Senate. I think there are also questions about a willingness to work with other parties when it comes to furthering an Indigenous mandate. I think a really great example of that would be Romeo Saganash's private members bill. If you say you're committed to reconciliation, I think you need to be willing to work with everyone to achieve those best outcomes. And I do think to many people, it seems like there isn't a willingness to do, to do that unless it specifically comes from the Liberal Party. So when you asked about those grassroots activists and communities who are upset, I think that's where you are seeing some of that disappointment. Uh, Mr. Coburn, your two cents worth, I suppose, uh, I don't know if you agree with uh, Ms. O'Neill, but what's the biggest uh, failing of the Liberal government? Well, I think overall just um, the use and, I guess, deployment of, I guess, reconciliation as sort of a sweeping term uh, for everything. I mean, it was a really ambitious mandate. Um, I give them credit for having probably the most ambitious and enthusiastic commitment to Indigenous peoples of any in, uh, government in Canadian history before. But I think it really fell short and it, it also left a lot of disappointment for Indigenous peoples. So um, as you opened and said, well, Indigenous support for the Liberals has has waned considerably and, and that may be because of the bad taste left in their mouth of, of um, tossing around words like reconciliation and failing to come through on significant promises that could have, could have been fulfilled in the last four years but otherwise have not. So. They sounds like they became buzzwords. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Trudeau brought it up in question period all the time, reconciliation or uh, there's no uh, relationship more important to Indigenous people. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, the Conservatives finally gave up some details of their plan just last week. Uh, for example, remove barriers to prosperity, create a dedicated ministry portfolio to consultation, and action on the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. 
is it enough to uh, overcome a kind of an indigenous distrust of that party? I don't think it is enough to overcome it. I think that Andrew Scheer himself has had a lot of problems when it comes to reaching out with Indigenous communities. And even when you've heard him in debates, when the language that he uses when he talks about Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities. And I think trust takes a long time to rebuild. And I think a platform this close to the election is in a great place to start building that trust. Now, I do think for some people who perhaps have problems with the Liberal government or who do lean a little more conservative, and especially people who are perhaps very angered by SNC Lavalin, if this is something that they're thinking about, there could be those few who are leaning towards the party, especially with some of the Indigenous candidates in different writings. But on a whole, I would say I don't think it's enough. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, uh, I guess what you've seen of the uh, campaigns and platforms, uh, should Indigenous people be worried about a uh, Prime Minister of Shear? Well, if if we were able to survive uh, the Harper years, then then I, I don't think that the sun is going to set and it's going to be dark. But uh, but you know their their hallmark as as conservatives, their hallmark is about reduced spending, and that typically ends up uh, a, on the social net. And so in that regard, there, there's there's potential and and high probability that we'll lose a lot of social funding. Um, they're very strong on the economy, and uh, and you know it's it's not as if indigenous communities are against the economy, but there seems to be too much of a focus on that. And, and their I guess their their culture, uh, their culture and their view of Canada is quite uh, different than other uh, liberal type um, uh, political parties. And and in that regard, really it 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 just brings back, it it takes takes us back ten steps quite easily. Um, Mr. Coburn, the Green Party and the NDP seem to say all the right things. Uh, uh, I know Ms. O'Neill brought up Bill C-262, they all say, and the Liberals do too, mm -hmm. that they'll uh, pass this into law. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not likely to form government, so should Indigenous people kind of um, gravitate there and wait, kind of throw their votes away? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily throwing their votes away. Um, I would, I would I'd, I'd echo a little bit of what um, Pizziola just mentioned about, I guess, some um, uh, apprehension of the Conservatives, especially when it was just admitted by Andrew Scheer that it was his orchestration that held up Romeo Saganash's passage of his private member's bill for um, recognizing and enshrining the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, held up to die on in, within the Senate when Parliament was dissolved. And it's, um, it's also something that they say is uh, within their platform is uh, they would have a national action plan for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls whereas right off the hop for the national inquiry said in their final report was the recognition of rights would be at the principle and so there is a little bit of hostility there so it wouldn't necessarily be uh, throwing their votes away per se because I don't know if they would get much in return from a conservative government and again to echo what, what Pizziola had mentioned is um, it would be cutting expenditures when it's still viewed by the Indigenous peoples that the Crown has a significant debt, even monetary in, in terms of rights as well, but in terms of monetary and financial expenditures, they owe Indigenous peoples quite a bit of money and and uh, they would have to come through with that and it wouldn't see that materialize under a sheer Conservative government. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Coburn said about uh, possibly uh, cutting spending, so one of the promises to create a new ministry, uh, is that cutting spending or do we fear that uh, perhaps they'll close up Indigenous services or merge Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous relations back into one? And I think that's where it kind of goes back to that question, is this enough, right? I think that there are a lot of questions about how a new ministry would be formed and what would be lost if a new ministry were to be formed. I think there would also be a question about who the stakeholders would be, who the partners would be, what sort of relationships have been formed, right? We've had this entire election cycle. Has Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives been taking the time to go meet with different Indigenous communities and learn about their needs? Are they ready to prepare that? So I think there are some real concerns to be had there. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, I suppose if you're advising any of you on how to vote, and I know you're not, and you're not going to probably tell me how you're going to vote, but uh, what would you say to them about this, uh, this election campaign? Um, I, I wouldn't have much to say to Inuit because Inuit have been politically savvy for decades. Uh, they have an incredible uh, aptitude for, for politicking um, and just look at the, the patience uh, that Inuit have, not only culturally but politically. 
Um, that is that is a hallmark of Inuit um, engagement uh, with Canada. That uh, that's yielded uh, a lot of results. Um, some would say that it's, it takes too long. But you know, when the, when the when the stars align and you get the example uh, over the past four years, it's yielded incredible investments for Inuit and Arctic communities. So uh, I don't think uh, I think Inuit are, are really um, you know concerned about infrastructure, about housing, uh, even the economy. So in that regard, you know. Um, you know, uh, conservative values, liberal values. There, there is alignment. Uh, under, there is underlying alignment there. There is underlying values that are common between indigenous uh, communities, uh, as well as some of the, the some of the political philosophies of, of even conservatives. Uh, well, of course, they did uh, vote in a conservative four years ago, uh, Mr. Coburn. There's been talk of a coalition. Uh, government, either conservative or liberal, what would that do to, as the AFN called it, a government honoring its promises in the next mandate? Well, I think it would depend on who's leading it as uh, leading it as well. So we might see the antagonism, I guess, or a cold shoulder as it might be. I mean, that's probably the most charitable way I can ex describe uh, the conservatives' viewpoint and uh, disposition towards Indigenous peoples if it is um, any uh, reflection of the Harper years beforehand. Um, you may see, I guess, if, if the liberals probably try to warm up to indigenous people once again to shore uh, support for uh, for an election that would come around in uh, another four years from now. So to, I guess, create that constituency again that gave them such support in 2015 that uh, has dwindled now. So uh, minority would see, I guess, maybe uh, looking towards expanding bases where and um, an expanding demographic of indigenous peoples would be uh, ripe for political parties to address. Ms. O'Neill, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, do you want to predict how many Indigenous MPs might get elected this time? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> wow. I don't know if I could necessarily put a number on it, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps this was a history-making year. I think we have seen, we've seen so many people paying attention to debates. I think we've seen so many people engage in our system in a different way. And I think this time, instead of four years ago when it was engaging by voting strategically, it's people who are tired of the status quo and are taking things into their own hands. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw record numbers, and I also wouldn't be surprised if we saw more Indigenous sitting MPs across party lines. Okay, on that point, I want to thank you all for doing this. Thank you for talking to me today. Pleasure. Thank you, Todd. Thanks Pleasure. for having us. Thank you. After the break, a new Chalneth political scientist talks about how climate change and the environment have been handled during the campaign. Welcome back. Climate change and the environment have been major issues during the election campaign. However, a lot of debate has been around whether or not pipelines should be built or whether the carbon tax should be scrapped. Eli Anz is new Chalnut and is a political scientist and expert on biocultural heritage conservation. Anz joins me from Kingston, Ontario, where he gave a keynote address on protected areas and climate action. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Mr. Anz. Thank you. Now, what grade would you give the Trudeau government when it comes to protecting the environment and action on reducing carbon emissions? Well, a couple years ago it was an E for effort, but I, I think it's time to upgrade that letter grade um, I, I would give them a B uh, because there's been a lot of progress made. Um, they've put their, their money where their mouth is, so to speak, with the Nature Legacy Fund. And uh, we have 27 new Indigenous protected and conserved areas um, getting support and underway. So I, I think there's a lot of momentum that's been gathered over the last few years. What, was, what did, is the biggest difference between them and the previous Harper government? What was the biggest difference? I guess the mandate letters really set the course. And, and of course, there's been a lot of controversy over pipelines and, and carbon tax and such. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change hasn't really worked out well uh, for this government. Uh, but the mandate letters, once they took effect and once the, ver the ministries of environment started running with it, um, that we did see a noticeable change. Uh, the atmosphere in Ottawa, Ottawa was much more welcoming. Uh, you may recall uh, towards the end of the Harper government, um, there was a muzzle on scientists and um, generally there was an unwelcoming 
um, sort of sentiment uh, in regards to Indigenous protected and conserved areas. Um, so there's been great improvements over the last four years and, uh, you know, regardless of the election outcome, uh, we're looking forward to keeping that momentum going and honoring the commitments that have been made uh, by the government during this process. Uh, you talked about momentum and commitments by the Liberal government. If they do get back in, uh, what more do they have to do? Uh, well, I think uh, one of the major tasks ahead is for the federal government to figure out appropriate recognition. Uh, we've been fairly repetitive that um, in terms of Indigenous protected and conserved areas, first and foremost, this is an exercise of Indigenous law and Indigenous jurisdiction. And, um, you know, the, peace, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said that reconciliation between Crown and Indigenous peoples can never happen until there's reconciliation with the land. And all, we don't have to look any further than the original peace and friendship treaties which were multilateral environmental agreements that um, accounted for living respectfully with one another, but also living respectfully with the land. And so I think it's a rediscovery and honoring of those peace and friendship treaties that we need to be able to turn the corner, not only on the extinction event, but on climate action. It sounds like uh, the climate change uh, or environmental platforms haven't taken into account the realities facing Indigenous peoples. Would you uh, agree or disagree with that? Um, yeah, I would say largely I would disagree. And, and I think that because the origin a lot of a lot of those, a lot of the thinking behind those platforms comes from a more conventional way of thinking about conservation and climate change. Um, there, there's a strong sentiment that science is the answer. And we don't dismiss science, but we also have to understand that indigenous knowledge systems has a lot to offer in terms of um, climate change action and also um, the conservation of nature. Most people would seem, assume the Green Party has the best climate change platform. Again, would you agree or disagree with that? I think they've, um, they've been very thoughtful. They did actually mention indigenous protected and conserved areas. Um, so I'm really glad to hear uh, and to see that in their platform. Um, of course, they're not a, the, the Green Party isn't a, uh, a one issue um, party, but also we have to give the Liberals credit because they actually created the political space and made a financial investment in moving the, the whole conversation of IPCAs forward. Um, I'd love to see um, you know, the Green Party and the NDP, and I'd, look, I'd like to see all parties coming together and, and getting beyond this party politics and this um, d dysfunctional way of governing a country um, and actually work together for the benefit of all of our collective grandchildren to come. That's what I'd like to see. Uh, of course, the Liberal government may be defeated. There may be a minority or majority Conservative government. Uh, when it comes to the environment, uh, their platform is basically scrap the carbon tax, make the biggest polluters pay somehow. Uh, so I suppose what are your biggest concerns if the Conservatives do form a government? Well, um, I'm actually not that concerned. Uh, most of my work in this field was done under the Harper government. And although it wasn't as friendly in Ottawa, we still got things done. And um, I think that we, we'll sh we, show, we show Conservatives and Liberals alike that um, we're not about uh, diminishing progress. We're, we're about having a different kind of progress. And we're talking about truly creating economic resiliency that is intimately and inextricably bound up with ecological integrity and cultural health and well-being. Um, New Channel uh, peoples and indigenous peoples right across Canada understand that all of these things are interconnected. And so I believe that if we can sit down and have, a, have a, a conversation about what our collective responsibilities are and, and just pause the conversation on, on the, the adversarial conversation that we've been uh, sort of going around and around in circles on and have that responsibilities-based conversation, I think that we can work together um, to uh, make a better world for our collective unborn future generations to come. Well, Mr. Enns, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I want to once again thank you for speaking to me. Wonderful. Thank you. Keep up the good work.
about it immediately after that. After you know, another challenge. break, we meet a Native American who's running to be president of the United States. Welcome back. Mark Childs is a Navajo activist, blogger, journalist, and a pastor. He's also running for President of the United States in 2020. Recently, APTN executive producer Justin Brake met up with him in New York City. He talked about the eye-opening experience of moving back to his reservation just after finishing university. It was living there that I, my eyes became much more open to not only the historical oppression and the, the, the historical trauma of our people, but how deeply marginalized our Native communities are even today. And it was after being there only even less than a year, one of the things I observed most quickly is that by and large, the, the majority of people who are not Native who come to reservations come for one of two reasons. They come to give you charity or they come to take your picture. Almost no one comes to build a relationship. Charles says America has been built on a lie called the doctrine of discovery, and reconciliation is the wrong word to be using. Reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. When I talk about this history in the United States, I don't use the term reconciliation. It's a misnomer. If you understand the history, you can't discover lands already inhabited. You can't do it. It's called stealing, it's called conquering. It's only because of the doctrine of discovery, which dehumanized Native peoples, which has allowed Christopher Columbus, Jacques Cartier, to discover North America, to discover Canada. And so the history started on this belief, this foundational understanding of dehumanization. And so reconciliation is not the proper term. Charles says a belief in American exceptionalism denies its genocidal history and racist reality. And I think Canada, again, just a bit more passive aggressive about it. You're not as explicit with your own exceptionalism. But there's still a desire to keep this. We're a good nation. We're a good country. We don't have that bad of a history. There's a, a desire to keep that alive. And that is what leads us to use these terms like truth and reconciliation. When it, that doesn't match the history. But it allows this, this notion of exceptionalism to maintain, to, to, to stay alive. Charles is three months into his presidential campaign. A small segment of America has heard my message so far. I am just beginning to introduce the content to begin to change the paradigm of our entire nation. I have 15 months left. I don't need them to vote for me today. I need them to vote for me. I need my nation to vote for me in November of 2020. That's our show. But if you missed any part of it, you can check out our podcasts. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. Next week, the ballots will be counted and we'll know who our next prime minister will be. Nation to Nation will do a post-mortem on the results. Until then, I'm Todd Lamaran. Thanks for watching.